Welcome to The Black Table, an hour devoted to exploring ideas and subjects of special importance to people of African descent and others fighting to build a better society. I'm your host, as usual, Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. And today, we uh, are very happy to have the brother we have now, especially important, you know, given the more recent spate of events and activities in Texas, from voter suppression to the energy grid failure to border wars caused by the uh, ostensible leaders of the government there to anti-abortion laws right up through the Uvalde shootings and, and beyond might lead some people to ask, what's wrong with Texas? Well, on Juneteenth Eve, the correct answer might be, well, it's doing what it was designed to do. So we're especially excited to sit for this hour with the thinker, organizer, scholar, and comrade who's widely recognized in the words of Roxanne uh, Dunbar Ortiz as the most important U.S. historian working today. And I might amend that a little to say the most important U.S. based for the moment historian working today. He's no stranger to this platform. He appears regularly in the Black Star Network, particularly with our brother um, and the culture with Brother Faraji. So today we want to welcome this this giant, really, force of nature, if you use word Churchill's words on his most recent book, Gerald Horn. Welcome back to Black Star, Brother Gerald. Well, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Listen, I um. We're here to talk about, and we're going to get into this in the next couple of sections, segments after, to, uh, after this first segment, the counter-revolution of 1836. Um, I just left a group of high school students from St. Paul and Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I had the book with me. And so this one young brother from Laos, he was like, what you reading? And by the time I got through talking about it, they all took out their cell phones, which is, I guess, what they do now. <laughs> and, and, and screenshot covers. <laughs> so uh, so they're going to be a whole bunch of uh, they juniors, I guess. So they're going to be a whole bunch of 16 and 17 year olds in Minneapolis, St. Paul, reading this brand new published book. Um, beyond the particulars, Gerald, and for those who really want to get a deeper dive, I thought the interview that you conducted with the Activist News Network, the biographical mm. interview, was excellent. That long form. Those of you who want to know more about Gerald, uh, Mississippi Roots, St. Louis born. Uh, has all the papers that allow him to float through places like University of Houston, where he's the Moore's professor of history and African American studies. Uh, but, you know, the J.D., of course, uh, from Columbia. No, not Columbia. You Cal Berkeley. Cal Berkeley, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ph.D., of course, from Columbia and the uh, the B.A. from Princeton. And we're talking about what are we now? Three dozen books and counting. And uh, for those of you who look over my shoulder from time to time, that second shelf. That's all Gerald. <laughs> so uh, I've got them all, brothers. We can't, you know, including the one that your sister did on your mother that we were talking about. So we got to we got to get on that at some point. But help us understand how you came to the place that you are now. Um, again, Roxanne uh, uh, Dunbar Ortiz on the, on your most recent book says that, you know, you are she calls this book a book that you need to understand U.S. history in the present. You have to you have to have this book. And you've undertaken the work of no less than really rewriting how we think about the modern world, one book at a time. And as Ward Churchill says, it's all interlocking. It all builds on kind of a momentum from it interacts with the previous books. But tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, Gerald. Well, as you suggested, my familiar roots are in Mississippi, the heart of darkness of, of Dixie. That's where my parents were born and raised. Uh, they migrated, fled, in fact, uh, northward to St. Louis, where I was born in a segregated hospital, uh, Homer G. Phillips Hospital, now defunct uh, in St. Louis. Uh, growing up uh, in that Jim Crow bastion, going to uh, all black schools uh, through high school, uh, starting work at an early age. Um, I think, as I've said on, on numerous occasions, part of the key to where I am today is the fact that I was a child laborer. Now, I don't recommend child labor, but it had a dramatic influence upon me because I started uh, as a newspaper boy about six or seven years old. Mm. And of course, it's not only the experience of being robbed <laughs> repeatedly, which obviously has a dramatic impact, but also starting to read newspapers uh, at an early age. A admittedly, just the sports page and the comic strips. 
uh, I hardly read the comic strips nowadays, but I certainly read the sports page uh, first thing in the morning, which has been a lifelong habit. And I think that uh, reading the newspapers then leads me into the St. Louis Public Library. And I should also say uh, having older sisters as, as well, uh, because without going down a rabbit hole, I, I do think that for a young black male, it becomes easier to immerse yourself in literature if you're sort of tailing after your older sisters to a mm -hmm. degree, which is what I was basically doing. I was sort of reading whatever they were passing down to me. Mm -hmm. And so that's what got me on the track to where I am today. Yes, sir. And again, I mean, I would recommend those of you uh, get your hands on uh, your sister uh, Lyka's book, Mother Wit about your mother. Say, say a little bit about, if you don't mind, just for a second, um, mention something about your parents. Well, my father, um, born in Mississippi, as suggested, mm -hmm. near the Alabama border, uh, was a truck driver. And in fact, uh, he was a member of the Teamsters Union. Mm. There hangs a tale because not only did I grow up uh, reading Teamsters literature, but also for those who may be familiar with the history of that union, which used to bill itself as the largest union in the capitalist world, obviously uh, quite corrupt, to put it mildly. But St. Louis was different. St. Louis Teamsters was led by Harold Gibbons, who was a social democrat and also was anti-Vietnam War. And I think that that had a particular impact upon myself insofar as uh, I became quite acquainted with the strength and power of unions at an early age, particularly unions that were led by the left. And then my mother uh, was born in Stockville, Mississippi, which is the home of Mississippi State University. Wow. And we just had uh, Lou Outlaw. Oh, we we talked to right? oh, of course. So Starkville, Mississippi, of course, that's that's his hometown. Is that right? Yeah, oh, man. I didn't I didn't know that. <laughs> and and uh, her father was a janitor, in fact, at Mississippi State University. Wow. And she was able to graduate from high school. Wanted to go to Alcorn, but was not able to put it together financially. Uh, but always had an interest in current events. So we grew up in St. Louis with the background being KMOX radio, one of the most powerful signals in the Midwest, yeah. uh, listening to all news radio <laughs> perpetually <laughs> and St. Louis Cardinals baseball games. Yes, sir. That, that's yes, what sir. I grew up listening to. Yes, and that's what my, my mother grew up listening to. Uh, mm. St. Louis Cardinals baseball and all news. Yeah, that, that actually... And I know, and like I say, we're going to have to, we could do this over and over again. I, I encourage folk to get really get that Activist News Network interview because you go extensively for hours about this. And I, as you're talking, obviously, um, I guess one of the most recent books, of course, on boxing, right? Yes, the, uh, the Bittersweet Science. <laughs> I'm waiting on the baseball book now. I shouldn't threaten you. You're going to have to, you have to do it. But um, of course, and we could talk about this for those who want to go on. In fact, in your most recent book, In the Counter Revolution, you actually do cite uh, in passing Walter Johnson and his new book, uh, The Broken Heart of America, The Importance of yeah. Salute, man, which is so critical. And we could talk a lot about this. But I want to get in the first segment before we, 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 we close out the first segment. Your work hasn't just been academic work, obviously, from Princeton to Berkeley to Columbia. Um, you work with National Council of Black Lawyers. Yeah. Um, you've traveled the globe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I guess it all empties into your work. I guess I want to ask you a very broad question about your, your, your books. And now you're over three dozen and counting. Um, as I said, Ward Churchill says that they all inter interact with each other and they kind of build this force of momentum. What are you trying to get at with your scholarship and how has your work in what some people might call the real world influenced your scholarship and vice versa? Well, I think that this current book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism, I think the very title itself suggests what I'm seeking to accomplish. One of the points I'm seeking to accomplish is to puncture this liberal mythology about mm -hmm. the history of the United States of America, which I think leads to ideological disarmament uh, on the part of the U.S. left, on the part of black people in general, 
It does not prepare us for the winter that's ahead with regard to a possible rise of a unique form of U.S. fascism. And I think that the travel that I've done uh, from the, my early 20s for a few decades, uh, I was perpetually on the road. And interestingly enough, uh, before the pandemic, I was perpetually on the road doing research travel. But even in doing research travel, you can't help but notice, for example, if you travel to Southern Africa or live in Southern Africa, as I did, uh, you can't help but notice the parallels between U.S. apartheid and South African apartheid, uh, for example. Uh, certainly, if you look at the books that I did on the South Seas, mm -hmm. on Hawaii and the general region up to and including Fiji, Australia, and New Zealand, and the indigenous population, the black population there, uh, obviously there are parallels between the kind of genocide that was inflicted upon those populations and the genocide that was inflicted upon uh, the indigenous population of, of North America. So mm -hmm. it becomes difficult to accept the liberal mythology of the United States, that is to say that the creation of the United States was a great leap forward for humanity. Uh, the country was founded uh, by these remarkable men, Thomas Jefferson, Madison, etc., who veritably walked on water. We haven't seen the likes of them before or since. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to puncture that mythology because, as I said, it doesn't really prepare us for what's just around the corner. It didn't prepare us for January 6, 2021, for example. So um, I, I think that this book, in a sense, is just another chapter in an ongoing saga that I'm trying to construct. Excellent. Well, we, we, actually, that's a good place for us to pause. Um, when we come back from the break, we're going to go into the counter-revolution of 1836, your most recent book and what a timely book it is. So with that, we're gonna pause for a moment and we'll be back in a moment at the Black Table, Black Star Network. Verizon just gave us all a brand new iPhone 13. We've been customers for years. I thought new phones were for new customers. We got iPhone 13s too, switched to Verizon two minutes ago. Ours were busted and we still got a shiny new one. Check it out. So wait, everybody gets the same great deal. I think that's the point. iPhone 13 on us for every customer, current, new, everyone on any unlimited plan, starting at just $35, all on the network more people rely on. Welcome back to the Black Star Network, The Black Table. I'm Greg Carr, your host, joined today by Professor Gerald Horn. And we're about to start our discussion of his most recent book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836. Prof, when we left, you were talking about your larger overall project, and I would encourage everyone um, to get all those books, <laughs> quite frankly. I mean, you talked about Southern Africa, something about white supremacy confronted, I guess was one of the more recent books you wrote, mm -hmm. uh, of course, from the barrel of a gun about Zimbabwe. And again, mm -hmm. all, all these various books. And, and I want to start this conversation on your most recent book, again, with the court, quote that Ward Churchill has about, it. he says, over the past quarter century, Gerald Horn has seemingly undertaken the task not only of refuting the entire complex of fraudulent narratives undergirding the U.S. set the state's brazen self-portrayal as the world's exemplar of freedom and democracy, but concomitantly of exposing the squalid realities comprising its actual history. Truer words are never spoken, brother. <laughs> so in this book, which of course now spra sprawls up to 600 pages and covers everything from you, you reveal two Juneteenths, you talk about the Texas Rangers as the above ground version of the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, mm -hmm. everything from the, the, the framing of, of, of how everything we think about, we're going to have to rethink. 
I wonder if you could take a moment and help us understand Texas, because mm -hmm. at the beginning, throughout the text, and then as you kind of summarize, you talk about Texas both facing west and facing east. And you mm -hmm. almost say you can't understand the United States if you don't understand Texas, settler colonialism, imperialism, race wars. T talk a little bit about why, why is Texas so important, even beyond its borders in the United States and in the world? Well, Texas today has the largest black population in the United States of America, which is not accidental, as I shall point out momentarily. But Texas also, in terms of facing west, probably had the most extensive project of liquidation and genocide of an indigenous population in North America, which is really saying something, given what we know about the history of North America, for example. And I think it's particularly the case since Texas contained in the 19th century, this militant, fearsome Comanche population in particular, and it took enormous bloodshed to liquidate that population. As well, Texas included a substantial cattle population, C-A-D-D-O, which had an interlocking director with the black population. And then Texas also had numerous other indigenous populations. So for example, I'm particularly proud of what you'll see on page 26 in a footnote. Uh, we oftentimes hear the slogan, understandably, uh, say their name. Well, they're out of list, all of these Native American groupings. Sure, are can, can I bring it just for a second? Because that, that footnote 104, I will tell you, brother, that man, when I read that, it was like you were pouring a libation. I've never seen that many indigenous names in one place. So what did you, uh, and I, I saw one of the uh, one of the sources was Paul Berber, uh, Country mm -hmm. First and the Driven. But yeah, that, so that was deliberate then. You did that on purpose. Oh, absolutely. Because I think that you really can't understand the history of North America without understanding the indigenous question. And uh, I don't think you can understand the indigenous question without understanding the Texas question. Now, let me go back to 1836. Yeah, please do. And by the way, as you do it, I'm, I'm thinking about your earlier book, The Counter-Revolution of 1776, which caused quite a stir once yes. the 1619 Project writers became aware of your work, pulled you in. It seemed like that set off all kind of, <laughs> of, of fights. But, I mean, as you have reframed the beginning of this settler enterprise and the Counter-Revolution of 1776, that book, you the Counter-Revolution of 1836, though, it's almost like... No, this is the founding in some ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really blew my mind. So, yeah, please. Why 1836? And a lot of people might not know Texas didn't start as a state. It was going to be its own country. Exactly. Texas seceded from Mexico in 1836, not least because Mexico, under a president of African descent, speaking of Vicente Guerrero, had moved to abolish slavery and therefore had joined Haiti, revolutionary Haiti, in camaraderie. That means that when Texas seceded and set up an independent state, the Texas Republic, 1836 to 1845, it was the only slave nation uh, in the context of the United States, that is, that bordered an abolitionist state, uh, speaking of abolitionist Mexico. Wow. And as well, Texas saw itself in, as being in competition with the United States of America, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the United States of America, not coincidentally, tried to hamper Texas by engineering the so-called Trail of Tears, where they frog marched the Cherokees, the Choctaws, the Creeks, and other Native American groupings from the southeast quadrant of North America, speaking of Georgia in the first instance, across North America to Indian Territory, today's Oklahoma, conveniently for Washington on Texas's northern border, and it was not accidental. They wanted to put a number of disgruntled indigenous peoples on Texas' northern border in order to hamper Texas. In, but it did not hamper Texas. In, in fact, what was the, the symbol you described Oklahoma, the physical shape of Oklahoma, the territory at the time? What did you call it? <laughs> I think it's, it's a, cle a bloody cleaver. A bloody cleaver. Hang, hanging over Texas. That, that's mm. what it resembles. Mm. And so... What happens is that Texas, as an independent country, becomes a leader of the unlimited African slave trade. In fact, I talk about that in my book on Cuba, Race to Revolution, where already I point out in that text 
that one of the reasons you have so many black people in Cuba is because of the Republic of Texas. Uh, the Lone Star flag of independent Texas could be found off the coast of Angola, off the coast of Brazil, and certainly off the coast uh, of Cuba. Interestingly enough, in my book on Brazil, I point out that uh, Texas enslavers were also uh, complicit when it comes to understanding why Brazil has the largest black population on this side of Nigeria, for example. Yes. Yes. But alas, Texas, independent Texas, could not withstand the pressure from independent uh, Haiti, from independent Mexico, from abolitionists in Cuba and North America, and crawled into the Union. Although, for the legal eagles in the audience, they may want to take note of the fact that how Texas entered the United States did not necessarily comport with the U.S. Constitution. It should have required a supermajority since it was an independent state, uh, but it was only a simple majority. And so I don't know what people want to make of that, perhaps to expel Texas from the Union. <laughs> yeah. Well, they'd they love to go, perhaps, some of them. Exactly. So I'm not so sure about that. I but ask, well, I'll ask you a little bit about how Texas, how international politics plays a role, because you walk through how France, yes. the, the, the fight between, and I love, by the way, you know, one of the things that you always do, you refer to these countries by their capitals. So you talk about these people of African descent who have some fidelity to London. However, Paris is driving in terms of Mexico. They've got their own designs. And then you bring in every the Buchanan administration because the U.S. might think, well, we, maybe we should absorb Mexico. I mean, all these actors are going on. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little about how this the, 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 the activities of the people in Texas, these white nationalists in Texas, they find themselves at odds with this kind of international uh, entry going on and battle between superpowers? Well, in particular, they're in conflict with Haiti, they're in conflict with Mexico, and to a certain degree, they're in conflict with London. But France uh, rallies to the defense of independent Texas. And if I'm allowed to fast forward, yes. I can talk about how during the US Civil War, France takes over Mexico. And in fact, the Mexican-American holiday Cinco de Mayo is tied to a Mexican victory over the French occupiers yes. during the US Civil War, 1862. And then after the U.S. Civil War ends, the Texas enslavers have this idea that since Texas was the Confederate state least damaged by the U.S. Civil War, which helps to explain why enslavers from Virginia, uh, Georgia, and points east, even before 1865, were marching their so-called African property uh, into Texas. So the and, idea... And, and I didn't have any idea that San Francisco, even in California, they're suborning some of this stuff by supplying some of these cats in Mexico, right? So it's coming from both directions. Well, absolutely. And then, of course, uh, San Francisco ha has a, a substantial uh, French influence too, French reactionary influence, I should add. Yeah. And so th this brings, you, brings us to the point you, you flagged in your opening about the two Juneteenths, because the traditional understanding of Juneteenth is that uh, June 19, 1865, General Granger and the Lincoln Army march into Galveston, the slave port, tell the Negroes that they're free. Supposedly, they didn't know. Of course, they did know, because the real story is, is that the enslavers in league with French-occupied Mexico, either A, was going to continue the war against Washington with French assistance from, uh, from Mexico, or B, a move in mass uh, south of the border and continue the enslavement of Africans. But what happens is mass uprisings by the Mexican population against the French, leading to the execution of the French puppet Maximilian on the 2nd Juneteenth, June 19th, 1867, huh. which I argue is the Juneteenth we really should be celebrating because that brings us closer to an effective ending of enslaved, but much more so than the original Juneteenth, 1865. So we're going to pause here for a moment, Gerald, with that with that revelation that there there are two Juneteenths, and when we pause, we're going to pause, and when we come back, we're going to pick up from there and talk about um, this continuing significance of Texas, this all these actors that are involved. Uh, talk more about the indigenous folk, and uh, you you 
you make an observation about the Buffalo soldiers that is mm. very, very important, I think, in terms of even informing how people of African descent think about our own politics here in the United States right now. And of course, you always tie it to today. So uh, back in a moment at the Black Table, Professor Gerald Horn and his most recent book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. Back in a moment. Welcome back to the Black Table. Uh, we are continuing our conversation with Professor Gerald Horn, Morris Professor of History, University of Houston, and our most important historian. And he's been that for a very long time. He continues to work. Um, so, Gerald, when, when we left, we were, uh, you had led us to the two Juneteenths. Oh, and you know, I mean, this book is fascinating for so many reasons. You talk about the fact that the last Confederate general to surrender was not in fact a Euro American. And, 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 that, and that opened up. I, I was on a conversation a couple of weeks ago about Tulsa and one of the indigenous Afro indigenous folk in Oklahoma was like, we, you know, when you say Juneteenth, we kind of chuckle. Could you help us understand how June 19th, 19, 1865 wasn't even the end of the plans for the Confederates to continue to fight? I think you described Appomattox in April of that year as a, as a, as a temporary pause as they regroup, right? Or, or the secession of conflict, even in what becomes the United States. I mean, you talk a little bit about that in terms of, you know, how they were going to continue this conflict. Well, reference my previous point about French occupied Mexico yes. and Texas and slavers who plan to continue the conflict even after Appomattox, even after the formal surrender of Robert E. Lee. Now, what's interesting is that the Cherokee in particular and the Choctaw to a certain degree as well, were seeking to assimilate to Euro-American norms. And so they were enslaving Africans. And that helps to shed light on the fact why there were so many indigenous peoples. And I should say with all fairness, so many people of Mexican origin as well, Mexican-American origin, I should say, who fought for the Confederacy. And so one of the last Confederate generals to surrender was Stan Wati, who was of Cherokee origin. So what happens, <laughs> of course, is that Washington puts more pressure on the indigenous slave owners to disgorge their property and make 40 acres and a mule a reality for the black people owned by the uh, Confederate uh, slave owners is this, this of, the, of indigenous descent. Is this the so, Six Treaty? This is, the, is this the 1866 treaty? Right. Right. We still see being disputed to this day. Are there, I mean, uh, Deb Holland, the Secretary of the Interior. We've seen the freedmen having arguments about this treaty. Help us understand. Okay, so they're going to, 40 acres and a mule was something. They made a deal ostensibly with the Cherokee and the Choctaw as well for black people. Well, there's this continuing dispute, as you know, about the legitimate rights of the so called yeah. Cherokee freedmen. But yes. the point I was going to make is that because there was so much pressure on the indigenous population, the United States, of course, decided to basically punish and pulverize all indigenous people, not just the uh, Cherokee and Choctaw slave owners. But in any case, the black people who were controlled by these indigenous slave owners then emerged post-Civil War with a bounty. Uh, that is to say, with property, which then leads us directly into Tulsa, 1921, uh, when the Euro-American settlers invade uh, Greenwood the neighborhood, the black neighborhood of Texas, of Tulsa, sometimes referred to as Black Wall Street for whatever reason, and loot, plunder, and pillage, and basically seize all of their wealth and send the black people fleeing to the four corners of North America or huddling uh, in poverty within T uh, Tulsa. And of course, we mark the centenary of the Tulsa massacre just last year in 2021. Uh, there's ongoing litigation about the Tulsa massacre and the attempt to get reparations, uh, but it's just one more tragic tale. And I, I should mention an, another point too, which I, I should have included in the book, but this shows you why you have to keep reading and keep researching. So uh, I've come to find <laughs> that uh, Texas had a perverse and cruel form of lynching 
directed towards black people, black men in particular, I should add. That is to say, they would boil them in oil because as you know, uh, post uh, US Civil War, oil is uncovered on Texas soil. It's still one of the major oil producers on planet Earth. And so what happens is that not only were these black people uh, boiled in oil and uh, not only were photographs taken and they're on postcards that you can still find in museums, their digits were amputated and are still probably sitting in pickled jars on shelves and kitchens across Texas. And so Texas contributed heavily to the cruel persecution of black people uh, post US Civil War. And you asked about the Buffalo Soldiers as well, because I maintain in this book that one of the most flagrant errors of the black leadership, and this is probably saying something since there have been a number of flagrant errors, <laughs> is the fact that post US Civil War, you had black people in East Texas being terrorized by the Ku Klux Klan and their minions and acolytes. At the same time in West Texas as an insignia, an emblem of their newly found, newly minted citizenship, you had black soldiers, the so-called Buffalo soldiers, who were routing the indigenous population, chasing them off their land, which in some ways is inimical uh, to the black self-interest. Yes. But on the other hand, it's an emblem, an emblem and insignia of the newly minted citizenship. Joe, that, that, that is so important. One of, the, one of the great things you do in all your work, and in this book, it just seems like, as I said, the momentum continues, is you, you peel back and kind of detail what should be the political interests of these various groups. And you you leave us to think through what solidarity politics should look like. Um, I was stunned to learn, for example, that the French were contemplating transporting maybe what, around a thousand continental African troops yeah. from Egypt <laughs> to yeah. fight on the side of their side in Mexico against black troops in US uniforms and others. but the thing that everyone should oppose, and this is, of course, as we get into our last segment, you know, I really want you to talk about this as well. This 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 army, potential army of people fighting oppression are often set at each other's throats. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, this question of uh, whiteness kind of pulls together groups, some of which might be fighting against their own individual interests in Texas. I mean, you start the book with and you you march it completely through the text with this genocidal, this kind of proto, you call it proto-fascist kind of attitude toward non-whites that almost holds together this white interest. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. all these various nations and these people of African descent could end up at any moment on any side of what seems to be an emerging consensus among these whites that, you know, we are on this side. I mean, why do you think it, it was so difficult for people, I mean, actually, you raised that question for people for African Americans. Is that why can't y'all see this? Were they forestalled? I think you raised the question. What you know? What? Why couldn't they see that you're maybe working against your own interest? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think well, that's because the narrative we get, of course, now, the Buffalo Soldiers just celebrated June. To, everything is folded into this American exceptionalism, or in the case of, as you mentioned, Greg Abbott, Texas exceptionalism, that has us having a fidelity with the settler state when in fact you're revealing, no. I mean, was, how do we get to that? What happened, do you think? Here? Well, it's a question I raise repeatedly about the Native Americans, if you'll recall, because I keep asking, and I still continue to wonder, uh, why didn't the Native Americans make more dedicated alliances with London, with Russia, with uh, Haiti, for example, since it was clear that they were outgunned? And you can make the same argument with regard to black people as well. Why didn't they carry through on some of these alliances that they had effectuated before 1861, but seemingly dropped uh, post US Civil War, 1865? And then part of the process of, of puncturing liberal mythology and liberal historiography is this idea that in Texas in particular, the genocide did not only come from the leadership, it came from the bottom up. That is to say that many in the leadership, particularly in Washington, uh, post-1845, post-Texas, under the United States, they were confident 
that they could corral and contain the indigenous population, they put them on banter stands or reservations as we have come to call them. But the grassroots thought that that was a wimpy remedy. They thought that the Native Americans should be liquidated, that they should be wiped out. And I think that that's a lesson for today because even today we still have the slogan of the 1% versus the 99% without recognizing that a good deal of the 99% are actually supporting the 1%. Yeah. So we really should be talking about the one third, the Trumpistas, the proto-fascists against the rest of us, the two thirds. And so I think that liberal mythology does not help in terms of understanding that. Likewise, I think that if we're to understand this whole whiteness project, uh, this project whereby these disparate invaders and settlers from various parts of Europe uh, flock to North America and then unite under this uh, umbrella of whiteness, which cuts across ethnic lines, cuts across ethno-religious lines, cuts, cuts across class lines. And it's basically a class collaborationist project not unlike January 6, 2021, where you not only had a billionaire's interest being protected, speaking of Mr. Trump, but the invasion of the Capitol involves CEOs, involves shopkeepers, it involves retired workers, uh, involves the working class, et cetera. That is to say that it's rather interesting that even some of our friends on the left who pride themselves, if you listen to them, about their ability to evoke class. A, they don't evoke class when it comes to the enslaved African population, and there's no more exploited class than the enslaved African population. Uh, that's the class that they continue to refer to derisively in terms of their descendants, people like myself and yourself, as being enmeshed in identity politics. So they don't <laughs> invoke class with regard to that, and they don't invoke class when it comes to class collaboration of people of European descent, which leads in 1991 to 55% of Euro-Americans in Louisiana voting for a Nazi and a Klansman, David Duke, for governor. And so it's little wonder that we are about to enter a very cold and dark winter because we don't have our thinking caps on and we're not thinking straight about the history of this country. On that resonant chord, brother, and of course, uh, uh, it makes me think of your book, Jazz and Justice, where you <laughs> take it, where you take on the, the question of black music and read it through the politics. But on that resonant core, we're going to pause. And when we come back, we're going to enter our final segment with Professor Gerald Horn. And we're going to ask him to continue to kind of flesh out what he's just introduced, which is, of course, the contemporary implications of this work. So back in a moment at the Black Table here at the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network.
Welcome back to The Black Table. Greg Carr here at the Black Star Network, and we are joined by our brother and comrade, Gerald C. Horn, and we're discussing his book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836. And Prof, you led us right to uh, the end of your book. And, you know, this book of 25 chapters or 23 chapters, uh, 600 pages, you in the later chapters take us through what happens in Texas after the 19th century, voter suppression, the white primaries, the fight against that. And you lead us right up into today. Why is it? What lessons can we learn? I'll, I'll go at it that way. What lessons can we learn from Texas? And, you know, not only as a metaphor from the United States, and I love what you you quote a uh, scholar. I don't know if I can put my finger on the page number now, but you call the United States a prison of nations, mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. a prison of nations. And, you know, often people say, well, this our nation is who is we? Who is our? You know, what do you see ahead? in terms of Texas. And, and we'll have to continue the conversation at some point because I wanted to ask you about the compromise of 1850 and California. Mm-hmm. I mean, all of what becomes what was Mexico at one time. And you and, and and you all when you all read your horn, you always see you always do this, Prof. Whatever you're writing about historically, at some point in the rhythm of what you're talking about in the specific moment, you will then say, as, and it continues today, or as mm-hmm. we see today. So help us understand, what are the implications of this book for, book for today, both in Texas and in the United States? Well, let's work our way backwards. Uh, yes, we sir. know that today, Texas is a bastion of this demagogy about uh, anti-critical race theory, which is seeking to circumscribe the accurate and adequate teaching of history, particularly the history of slavery and Jim Crow. Uh, Texas is in the vanguard of clamping down on women's reproductive freedom with regard to this perversely innovative uh, anti-abortion law, which creates a bounty to go after both women and their providers, abortion providers. Uh, Texas, uh, not coincidentally, uh, helped to give us uh, George W. Bush, who led wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, a former governor. Uh, Texas uh, gave us uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who led a genocidal war in Indochina. Uh, Before Lyndon Baines Johnson in the 1950s, you had the rise of these Texas billionaires, uh, that is to say the Hunts of Dallas, the Merchants of Dallas, the Cullens of Houston, by some measures were regarded as the richest people on planet Earth. They're all oil men. And of course, you cannot begin to understand the right-wing trajectory of US imperialism today or in past decades without understanding, for example, the crusade against Iran post-1979, the crusade against Venezuela uh, today. And of course, uh, these Texas oil men were a major donor to Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin, who bequeathed his name to an entire political epic, speaking of McCarthyism, hysterical anti-communism, and a leader, a governor of Texas during this period, actually was seeking to have the death penalty installed for those who joined the U.S. Communist Party. Texas, even before then, was a lodestar for the Ku Klux Klan by some measures. The Klan had its most populous chapters in Dallas. And speaking of Dallas, how can you understand what afflicts the United States post-1963 without understanding the assassination of John F. Kennedy in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963? Now, let me step away from this gloom and doom and and suggest that the the good news is that uh, Texas, uh, because of these historical factors I've outlined, now has the largest black population in the United States of America, population that thus far has seemed immune to a good deal of the right-wing demagogy. Uh, That's good news. Mexico and Texas have had this uh, very uh, unfortunate relationship uh, going back to Texas secession in 1836. But now you see with the summit of the Americas in Los Angeles taking place as we speak, that the president of Mexico is leading a new hemispheric uh, alliance uh, that it features socialist Cuba, that it features Venezuela, uh, hopefully will come to feature Colombia after these uh, current elections, hopefully will come to feature Brazil after the upcoming elections. And it's that kind of internationalism that it seems to me 
that the black population in Texas needs to plug into, and also that the left population in Texas needs to plug into. And I would also say that given that the mantra from the 19th century was that either Texas would corral us or we would corral Texas. <laughs> and so I would say that even people in D.C., even people from the Atlantic to the Pacific, have an interest in keeping a close eye on Texas because since it's the second most populous state, it sends a disproportionate number of representatives to the House of Representatives in Washington, which is based on population. It's no accident that Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, Senator, uh, Governor Greg Abbott of Texas, or in the vanguard of all these right-wing maniacal policies with regard to handguns that are jeopardizing 10-year-olds in the classroom. So we all have an interest in, in, in seeking to restrain and corral Texas, and that's one of the reasons I wrote this book. Uh, and that we, of course, is a coalition of people who are really trying to build a different and better society. One of the things that you you detail extensively in this text, and it kind of fits, as I say, in the overarching or in, in the arc of your work is how much a part of a nationwide sentiment those Texas politics were. Uh, you talk about before and after 1989 with the collapse, so to speak, of communism and how prior to that there was a national interest in the United States of main, you know, kind of easing some of these race based restrictions. But with that out of the way, <laughs> the tail starts wagging the dog. I mean, and, and it was fascinating to hear you talk about even. The gestures toward annexing Canada, maybe. And this is coming from New York. I mean, like, what are they doing? You know, and then from DC, they're saying, well, maybe we should absorb Mexico into the United States. And then they wanted to break up Texas and maybe even create a Negro colony. And, and you mm-hmm. talk about that being consistent with Abraham Lincoln, who was like, yeah, emancipation and then exiles. <laughs> exactly. So, so how much of the work that is in front of us as human beings? is really about building solidarity that kind of discards these these narratives of national exceptionalism, particularly American exceptionalism. And do we have to give that up in order to to make any progress? Well, it depends on how you define it. I mean, I think there is U.S. exceptionalism in terms of the cruelty and perversity of the pain that's been inflicted upon the indigenous population and the African population. I, I still have trouble wrapping my mind around this idea of boiling black men in oil uh, post-1865 and then chopping them up uh, into little pieces and distributing uh, that to the audience. And it's sort of a a pre-radio, pre-television form of entertainment because there would be hundreds, thousands, sometimes up to 10,000 people would attend these rituals. And as you know, in my book on the 1500s, I talk about how in the 1500s in England, You had Catholics burning Protestants at the stake, and then then the the transition from religion to race, which features in the establishment of settler colonialism in North America. You have Catholics and Protestants sometimes linking hands with Jewish Americans as well and torching black people at the stake by the late 19th century. So that kind of exceptionalism, I think we have to highlight. But the old exceptionalism, which should be discredited, of the United States as this great leap forward for humanity, uh, that the founding fathers veritably walked on water, uh, that needs to be consigned to the dung heap of history. It's Mm -hmm. no longer useful. It does not help us to understand the present. It does not prepare us for a a future that may very well include a unique form of neo-fascism. And so that's part of the project. That's part of what I'm trying to accomplish in this current text. Mm. Well, man, we, we, we've reached, we're near the end, and I want to ask you a question just about your process and rhythm. You, you know, you're often described as prolific, and I think that word is too small to describe what you do. But, um, you know, I remember one time I was in Houston, and we, we, we met, for, we sat, and uh, I asked you about your process. We, we were James Conyers, the late James mm-hmm. Conyers. Mm-hmm. And... You have been stationary during COVID. You you opened this book with saying, "I did the best I could," which, of course, for you is right. But could you could you talk a little bit about? And this is for young people in particular who want to follow in your rhythms and and continue this work. Uh, your process. You you've been stationary, and yet you've been everywhere, including this venue. So, I mean, how do you go about doing this type of intellectual work when you physically? have been constrained by, by COVID, I mean, by, by the circumstances. 
Well, before 2020, I was on the road perpetually. Absolutely. And all you have to do is look at the footnotes of my books published over the past quarter century, and you'll get an idea of my travel itinerary. Yeah. But since February, March 2020, I've been in lockdown. So online, you can find an enormous amount of master's theses and dissertations, which I draw upon. And then I, I purchased a microfilm reading machine. There, there's a ton of, of <laughs> material, primary source material, that's not online. Everything is not online. And so now I'm plowing through reel after reel after reel. I could continue to do this indefinitely, quite wait, frankly. Wait, 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 wait. You bought a microfilm machine and then yeah. started purchasing microfilm. Or getting it through interlibrary loan. I got it. And you know what's ironic? I know at the institution that I'm at at Howard, they threw all the micro, microfish reading machines away except in special collections, one of the guard. He's got rid of them. But I don't think that's an outlier. I mean, you're, you're helping us understand everything isn't online. No, no. Far from it. I was wondering how you, because you have all these archival documents, you were, you're sitting there at the house reading them. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, for the current projects I'm working on, um, among other projects I'm working oh, on this okay, book. Okay, on, what you working on? So, okay, the, the next book is on L.A., but I, I finished the research mostly before the pandemic. Uh -huh. oh, excuse me, on uh, D.C., Washington, D.C., uh, your hometown. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I'm saying that now. I, I, I claim Philly and Nashville, but I guess I do live in D.C. <laughs> exactly. So that's next. And then I'm working on a book on Los Angeles, uh, Radicalism in Los Angeles in the 60s, the Panthers, Che Lumumba Club, the C Cultural Nationalists. Does this continue? I, I, you did the book uh, The Fire Next Time. Is this going Exactly. To it's sort of a, a, a sequel uh, okay. to that. It's a, it's, you know, the Huey P. Newton papers are all on microfilm. It's 99 reels. Eldridge Cleaver's letters are on microfilm, uh, for example. Uh, I'm looking at the trial transcript of the Angela Davis trial, which is quite fascinating. Leo Branton, it's the Tennessee State. Absolutely. State. Former yes, lawyer for Nat King Cole and Jimi Hendrix. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, it's 13 rolls of microfilm for the Angela Davis trial. So and then, of course, uh, I'm going to do this book on Northeast Africa, Egypt, Ethiopia in the late 19th century. Obviously, a good deal of that material, too, will be on uh, microfilm. So I, I have enough. I could I could stay stationary <laughs> indefinitely and just put out this pandemic out. retreats. Yes, sir. In fact, uh, we'll end with this. I'll never forget one time you were here in D.C. And, and, and folks, what Gerald's saying is true. Everybody in whatever archive you visit thinks you live in that city. People just think you live in D.C. because you're between the National Archives and the Library of Congress. You hear so much. But I remember one time we were talking and I asked you, Gerald, how do you you called it ruthless synthesizer? That's right. <laughs> so when you're looking at documents, let's end with that. When you're looking at and this is for everybody, I don't care if you're in the first grade, fifth grade, college, grad school or just want to do research on your own, when you're looking at a primary document, what's your attitude toward that document you're looking at? I mean, you're not just coming to it cold, obviously. Well, one of the things I'm always reminding myself, why am I looking at this document? I ask myself that perpetually. Why yes. am I looking at this document? Yes. And then why am I going to take this particular note? Oftentimes, it might be uh, some sort of pithy phrase. Just yesterday, for example, Howard Moore, you remember Howard Moore, the of flight course. lawyer? Yes, sir. Angela, he was telling the judge in the Angela trial that he should be reading James Joyce and Marcel Proust, which I found very strange. So I took a <laughs> note on that because I might be able to work that in. And so you, you have to always ask yourself, why am I taking notes? Because you don't want to take notes on a lot of material and then don't use it. And then leave it for somebody else yes. when you do, when you donate your papers to the Schomburg, for example. So uh, th that's part of my process. I see. Well, that book you're working on in North Africa, you already dropped some of those notes in this book when you talked about those kind of Africans, man, who they're going to send to Texas. The French are sending some black people from Africa. <laughs> oh, man, who were enslaved over there. Slavery still going on. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I found that material while doing the research on Northeast Africa. Yes. I found all this material about the French in Egypt and in Sudan and Algeria, in fact, who say, you know what? We need to send these Africans over to prop up our puppet regime in Mexico. And as I suggest, some of the Africans defect. Yes. And may have wound up in southern Texas, for all we know. My God. This this is it, man. Are, I'm a pause here because I get excited just listening to you and reading you and everyone, please 
this book, and we were talking before we went on, um, thinking how I'm going to work this into a class, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. Uh, Brother Jerry, we'll have you back soon, man, if we can squeeze into your schedule. This is a remarkable work, the latest in a string of remarkable works. And we want to thank you, man. Thank you for your example. Thank you for your work. And thank you for just, you know, being in this moment in space and time, because uh, I suspect your work is going to become much more important the clearer we become uh, in terms of, as V.I. Lennon might say, what what must be done. <laughs> no, so <laughs> thank you, man. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, of course, of course. We'll be back in a moment uh, to clear the table and get ready for our next moment here at the Black Table, Black Star Network. Back in a moment. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I gotta defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a Black man owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay Black, I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? Welcome back to the Black Table. Uh, Greg Carr, Black Star Network. We've just spent the hour with Professor Gerald Horn, his latest remarkable book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, and in the epilogue of that book in a section called The Struggle Continues. Professor Horn writes the following. Amid the gloom and doom, there remains room for optimism. Early in 2021, Martin Luther King III, son of the slain Nobel laureate, arrived in Oaxaca for the 190th anniversary of the death of Mexican President Vicente Guerrero, who in 1829 unleashed abolition of slavery, which then sparked Texas secession, then civil war, then delivering to us to the complicated present, delivering us to the complicated present. He was accompanied by President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador and was welcomed in turn by the population of African descent, which was estimated at about 5% in Oaxaca and 2% nationally. In extending the hand of friendship across the border, this development of a foreign policy from below is a surefire way to block the ascendancy of a recrudescent fascism. Joe Horn has always showed us the way to think about our relationships to each other in a world hell-bent on oppressing those who haven't yet put their power together. And with this book, we get a roadmap as to what has been done and what we can do to stop that type of oppression. So we'll see you next week. Happy Juneteenth for everyone uh, who observes it. And get this book so you can understand why you should not stop there.